Welcome in, Illini Nation. This is the Illini Cast, part of the Armchair Illini Network. And we couldn't be more excited about that new headline, as well as the fact that the Illini are in the Elite Eight. So a couple of elite pieces of news. Let's uh, briefly talk about our news first, and that's that's that we are a part of the Armchair Illini uh, website and their podcast network as well. So Sonny, this is exciting news for us. Uh, we thank Big Banter for everything that they've done, but uh, we'll still maintain a little bit of relationship. We'll have some of their Big Banter podcast partners on our on our show as well whenever we get into Big Ten football season and to do some off-season topics uh, for the Illini basketball program and the Big Ten basketball programs as well. But this is really exciting. We can't uh, thank Alex enough. It's going to be a fun situation being a part of Armchair Illini, Sonny. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this show has grown uh, tremendously since uh, August. I think it was our first episode uh, shortly before the football season started. And to reach the levels that we've reached now, I'm, you know, I'm flattered. I'm floored that you guys take the time to listen to us uh, as often as you do. Um, YouTube wise, you know, we're I think I saw someone pointed it out to me like um, we're the second biggest YouTube channel uh, based on Illini athletics, which is just completely surprising to me. And uh, honestly, over the past couple of months, we've gotten overtures from several different outlets asking uh, to see if we wanted to go under their umbrella. But, you know, we always had a really good time uh, with Big Banter and, you know, Brant, I owe a lot to kind of giving me my start doing all this. And so we've never really felt the need to go anywhere else. Uh, and then the Armchair Illini guys kind of reached out. And that's a website that's reaching almost 300, 400,000 uh, eyes a month. And that's a lot of Illini fans who, you know, may or may not know that Illini cast even exists. And, you know, just going through their website, they just do fantastic work with their content, uh, their articles, you know, the Illini basketball uh, guys, they're amazing at what they do. Their watch parties, um, you know, are super enjoyable to watch. And so, you know, after just kind of thinking it over between Austin and I, it just kind of made sense for our show, for the Illini cast to kind of take that next step, um, you know, expose ourselves to a, a larger Illini audience that, again, we don't know whether they know we exist or not. So I'm super excited uh, moving forward. We've already had some armchair Illini guys uh, on our show in the past, and, you know, I'm Sure, we're going to continue to do that now uh, that we're all under the same umbrella. But again, as you said, nothing but positive, wonderful things to say about the Big Banter Boys. Uh, they always have an open invitation onto our show, and it, you know there'll be future collaborations uh, for sure. But I think uh, if you're involved in the Illini community, this is a great news for everybody. Absolutely, I mean there are so many great creators in the Illini content space and we are excited to be a part of a great uh website with uh armchair Illini. they have a lot of great articles on their website you may see sunny and i pop in and write an article or two get our uh fingers uh unrusted first and and get some words out of there that's not coming uh through audio lease so that'll that'll be uh awesome as well to see uh those articles be posted um but it's just exciting that you guys have watched us uh, from the beginning of the football season all the way until this point and such a short time frame and really only one school year. And we've uh, done this. So thank you to you all for your support and that this couldn't have been possible without you guys watching and listening and uh, sharing on us on Twitter. So uh, just thank you to you listeners uh, for our, for your support. Yeah, absolutely. Our goal was to hit 500 subs by uh, the end of uh, the basketball season. And thanks to the last couple of weeks, we've flown by that. I mean, again, it's just super beneficial for our channel. Somehow, I think now we're eligible for like super chats and all that fun stuff now that YouTube offers. And, you know, as a content creator, this is just it's such a, I don't know, like a redeeming feeling because uh, Austin and I just wanted to talk sports. We just wanted to talk Illini. There's not many people on the YouTube space that were doing it. So we wanted to kind of offer our own perspectives. And, you know, Austin's got a background in doing all this. I don't. I come from a marketing world uh, in my nine to five. So trying to do this was something completely unique 
And uh, I'm just really enjoying the ride. I'm really excited about our future. And Austin, I'm really excited about watching our basketball team. How about you? Absolutely. Talk about continuing the ride. And that's what Illini basketball did last night, winning 72 to 69 over Iowa State. My goodness, what a fun first half. And then the second half was an emotional roller coaster. But Illinois had control of this game the entire game. It felt a lot like to me the Illinois Loyola game uh, from the Io DeSumo and Kofi Coburn year, but only we were in the shoes of Loyola. Yes, there were runs by Illinois in that game, but every time we got close, Cameron Crutwig and crew uh, shut the door in Illinois' face. We shut the door on Iowa State's face at all times. It got as close as it did two points, but then we scored four more, and then it was a six-point game. Then they battled back to two more. Then we would kick it back out to six to eight. And so that's kind of the flow of this game. Good teams are going to make runs. So that's why I wasn't extremely nervous about this game going in in that second half because I felt like the confidence that Illinois, as long as they maintained a lead, they were going to win that game. If they would have lost the lead, then I would have been like, okay, uh, this Iowa State team means business. But with Terrence Shannon and with the fact that um, – Dane Danger stepped up a little bit too in that second half. I felt completely fine that Illinois was going to win that game and take on UConn. Yeah, it's a, it's a game that as soon as the ball was tipped off, uh, Illinois established that they were the better team on the court. I watched the game with a couple buddies, one of who uh, doesn't watch much college basketball. He's an NBA guy, and he was really confused. He's like, wait, how is Iowa State the number two seeded team and Illinois the number three seeded team? Um, the Illini just came out to play. Um, all credit to Brad Underwood and the coaches. They had a game plan. The game plan worked. Iowa State, they just seemed, especially in the first half, just super nervous. And they're taking really awkward shots that I don't know if that was the plan. Uh, but, you know, they were kind of forcing shots. And the shots that they did take were just not very good ones. But Terrence Shannon just came to play, as he has for the past few weeks now. Basically, he made the first three-pointer of the game, I believe. I, I believe it was him. And he just yep. kind of never stopped there. He had, I think, what, 29 points? Um, 29 out of 72. Uh, but, again, all credit to the Illini. When he went out with uh, four fouls in that second half, we all held our breath a little bit. All of us were like, all right, well, now let's see what happens. And we were able to maintain our lead. Not maintain they I think it was like an eleven point lead, which um Iowa State had brought it down to four um in Terrence's absence. But we knew that was gonna happen. You know, Iowa State is a good basketball team, so we knew that they were going to make a run at some point. And in my predictions, I think I said that the game would be close at the end, but then Iowa State would make the plays uh to come out with a W, but I was wrong. And it was the Illini that uh happened to do that. And it's just it's the benefit of having such a, you know, a veteran team, um, you know, a coaching staff who just, they had a really solid game plan uh, from the onset, the way they played Damask and kind of invited that double team every single time. Uh, they knew which passes to make once that double team came. And uh, it's just really fun to be an Illini fan right now. When Terrence came back from his suspension, I said that the, suspension time where the guys had to play without Terrence was going to be extremely valuable to this line of basketball program. And it for sure did those guys already knew how to play without Terrence. This team already knew what that feeling was going to be like. It wasn't like losing a pacifier when you're a baby um, and you don't know how to react to this new found environment. Illinois already maintained that environment in the middle of the season where you could rely on Marcus Damask, where you could rely on Dane Danger to play some great minutes for you. And that is what happened. And, I mean, it was a three-point game, but with the free throw situation, it very well could have been a 12-point game, a 10-point game. I predicted a nine-point victory just because of Ter the Terrence Shannon factor. And I think it was closer to a nine-point game than anything. Everyone talked about the Iowa State defense and how great that was. Yes, they did force Illinois to get 12 turnovers, but Illinois forced Iowa State 
into nine turnovers. And I know a lot of Iowa State fans would say, yeah, but if we made our layups and everything, there's a reason why those layups were missed. There were some contested shots near the rim for Iowa State. And this Illinois defense came to play. They got the stops and the steals when they desperately needed them when Iowa State was making a little bit of a run. Um, so I just think that this team was just so valuable um, without Terrence Shannon in the middle of the season just to experience this feeling. And it just is great to see it actually practiced in the NCAA tournament. And again, you know, I, I've said this a couple times, like just the coaches did a fantastic job. Every role player, we talked about this kind of in the preview on we needed them to step up because you kind of assumed that they would take the mask out. Um, so that whole, the whole booty ball um, part of our offense would probably not be available. So we needed Quincy to make his open shots. We needed Coleman to make their shots. Quincy's game didn't may not have shown much in the box score, but I thought he was fantastic, in particular defensively. Our length, you can tell, really, really bothered Iowa State. We were crashing the rebounds for every rebound and just guys just climbing over their guys to make sure, you know, that there was no second chance points um, given up to the Cyclones. Ty Rogers played his butt off. Uh, again, my buddy who doesn't watch college basketball was like, who's that guy? He reminds me of Rodman. I was like, yeah, you know, that's kind of a, a fair uh, comparison there. And it's just the game plan was perfect. Uh, Luke Goody made his three pointer at the end. You know, it's it's a, a huge crucial three that we absolutely needed. Justin Harmon played some solid defense. DGL came in and gave us some minutes. The danger zone that we're in right now continued. Uh, he had some up and down moments in the game, but you know his big body you can tell really bothered Iowa State and uh, you know his his ability to grab some of the rebounds. It's just. It was a great game for everybody. And, you know, that includes Marcus Damask, who, again, may not have had great numbers, but I just think he made the right choices. He only had, I think, five assists, but a lot of he had a lot of hockey assists, uh, as someone was referencing who I was listening to earlier. He, he made the right pass, which led to another pass. And uh, Illinois was doing a lot of that yesterday. And Iowa State has a fantastic defense. They really do. And you kind of saw bits and pieces of it. But the way Illinois is built is we're kind of built to beat that sort of defense that they employed out there. We have a lot of six foot six guys who can pass, who can attack the rim. And uh, again, the better team was pretty obvious from the beginning yesterday and, uh, you know, came out with the victory. I mean, you look at freshman Milan Monsilovic, averaged 11 points, Alex Bussey. Alec Bussey mentioned him quite frequently in our Iowa State preview. They held him to a single point. 0 for 4 from the field, one free throw made. That is unbelievable physicality. This was a Big Ten matchup that Iowa State really wasn't uh, expecting. This is what games against Michigan State, this is what games against Wisconsin, this is what games against Purdue can just make you callous for if you're an Illini player. You weren't scared of this defensive physicality at all. Yes, there were some traps, but the Illini were doing a great job of making it get to the third side of the court. So meaning left, right, left. And that was a lot of Terrence Shannon's open shots. There were some Quincy Guerriere open shots in that uh, corner, and they just didn't land. But the way the Illini moved the ball was pretty solid against this trap. And just physicality on the defensive side of the ball and the offensive side of the ball it was just awesome to see. This was a true Big Ten uh, basketball game that Iowa State thought was a Big 12 game. And uh, thank you, Big Ten Physicality, for helping shape how the Illini handled this game. Yeah, a lot of people have mentioned that, you know, the Big Ten is kind of uh, down this year and the Big 12 is the best conference in basketball. But you kind of... I guess you just put it that way. Like, you know, it's like we kind of beat them up. And Iowa State just didn't have a way to respond. Uh, their coach said in the press conference that the Illini were just hustling, hustling, hustling. They weren't letting any free points uh, occur. Terrence Shannon was doing Terrence Shannon Jr. things. It's uh, It was just a fun game to watch. Check it out, Seven. Thank you uh, for being a loyal watcher. Uh, he says the number of different lineups that Brad used showed – how flexible he can be with his game plan. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's done a masterful job. 
you know, again, inviting. They knew the double teams for Domask were coming. And so they had a game plan set up and get ready for that. And I'm really happy for Brad because obviously Brad's got that uh, reputation that we were all kind of sharing the burden on uh, about his postseason success. And he's that's gone now. You know, I think the Sleepers guy said it perfectly. Um, they were talking about uh, postseason play shouldn't really have much to do with how good of a coach you are. That's more for a legacy. And that's the only thing that's been kind of eluding Brad up until now. And now he's done it. You know, he's he's reached an Elite Eight. You know, Bill Self in his best year with the Illini reached the Elite Eight. So he's reaching areas that, you know, very few uh, coaches in the past have gone. And so... I'm really happy for Brad and, you know, I'm really curious about uh, what their game plan is going to be for UConn on uh, Saturday evening. Yeah. Shout out Colbert Hawkins. That's a guy that we haven't uh, mentioned uh, at all in this podcast. He always is the silent assassin. It feels like as loud of a personality as he is, uh, we forget about him at times when Dane Danger goes three for six with seven points off the bench. That seems to be like more attention grabbing than, oh, Coleman Hawkins, 12 points again. Great job. Uh, six rebounds. I mean, just a great effort by Coleman on the defensive side of the ball. Really was a catalyst when Terrence Shannon was off the court to uh, be that leader, be that guy that's r- rallying the troops and saying, hey, guys, we played without Terrence before. We're good. We're good. Um, he just had that uh, steady Eddie presence, which is wild to say from the guy Coleman Hawkins was two years ago. who was just frantic, chaotic energy at all times. And now he's like a guy that brings the most positive energy ever for a team in crisis modes. So. Um, that was just unbelievable. I, and again, like we talk about the margin of victory, that Dane Danger foul on the three point shooter. I mean, that uh, could have added some distance as well without that uh, in the in the mix. So there was just some moments in that game where Coleman Hawkins was just incredible, and um, kudos to him. Yeah, I think, I mean, Terrence Shannon Jr. was obviously the MVP of that game. Uh, he was the best player on the court as he has been basically every time he steps on the court um, this year. But outside him, I think Coleman Hawkins was the player of the game. He was just involved in everything, whether it comes to defense, uh, you know, swiping at their guys, um, the switches. He was always presenting himself to Damask uh, as soon as the double team was attacking Marcus. He was just in the right position. Did he take a couple weird shots? That's what Coleman Hawkins does. <laughs> Every now and then, once or twice, he's going to line up three, four feet behind the three-point line and uh, launch it out there. But one of them went in yesterday. So it's like, you know, you take the good with the bad. And, you know, just seeing Coleman's progression uh, from his freshman year where he seldomly played and now to become, like, arguably, you know, one of our most valuable players uh, on this team as a senior a testament to Brad, a testament to him for sticking around in the program. There's not a lot of players that do that anymore, especially in this day and age. Um, they don't really want to develop, sit and develop uh, with the coaches. They kind of just go chase the bag and or jump to the NBA. And, you know, Coleman Hawkins is going to be one of the finer stories uh, told when it comes to Illinois basketball history. I just looked at this. Um, the box score kind of for the first time uh, right before our podcast. Marcus Damask didn't have the best offensive game, seven points, but he did have five assists and six rebounds. But he played all 40 minutes Mm -hmm. of the game. I didn't realize that watching the game. I thought like, oh, maybe he did take a breather. Um, He did not. That that is against one of the, the number one defense in the entire country. And you play a full 40 minutes. That is an exhausting measure, but he handled it pretty well, regardless of the scoring effort. He kind of was a he kind of was a great presence just to be a facilitator in this game. And there, there's a game where you need a Marcus Damask facilitating game, and he did that for Terrence and for Coleman. Yeah, for a guy who's getting blitzed every time he touched the ball, you know, 40 minutes. What does that tell you? That tells you that. Again, the offensive numbers may not have been there, but Brad and the staff liked what he was doing. He was they had a game plan and he was implementing it perfectly. And, you know, Marcus, he's talked about it in some of these press conferences. And, uh, you know, 
he's in really enjoying the ride and he's just not letting does not want it to end just yet and so he's doing his part into you know again reaching us reaching levels that it's been a very very long time uh that we've reached and we're all enjoying the ride at this point and let's not forget the major three-pointer at the top of the key by Marcus Damask's NIL friend, Luke Goody. What an unbelievable shot that was. I know he told reporters at the end of the game, he's like, that did not feel right leaving my hand. And then it went in. I mean, I uh, talk about just everything going right for the Illini in certain moments where in the past, like if this was a game against Arizona in 2001, that shot banks off the front iron and Luke Walton gets the rebound. I mean, Illinois is in that prime zone right now where there is some luck, but it's manifested luck going on. And it's, I mean, it's luck, but it's, it's prepared luck. You know, you know, as you kind of mentioned, all these guys, Luke Goody, uh, Dane Danger, some games wasn't able to, you know, get on the floor earlier this year. Look at how he stepped up over the past uh, month or so. These are all guys who've had a up and down roller coaster of a season. But as you kind of said, you know, we it was all for this moment. And Iowa State is a very good basketball team. The two t- teams we uh, won in the first beat in the first round, uh, Moorhead State and Duquesne, they were okay basketball teams, but one that we clearly were better than Iowa State again was a number two seed. They were Ken Palm, I think, number four or five, if I uh, recall correctly. They're a fantastic team, and you need contributions from everybody on your team to beat a team like that under those type of lights. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, we talked about it. The role players played their roles to perfection. We talked about Quincy already. We talked about you know Coleman Hawkins, Luke Goody making that three pointer. It's just. It's it's nice sort of validation to the entire season that all these guys are going out with giving their best punch. Before this game, I was a little worried about the path that Illinois has had in the NCAA tournament. When you played a Moorhead State and you played a Duquesne versus Iowa State, who had a ex- extreme test in the first half, at least, against number seven seed Washington State. I thought the lack of a test might hurt Illinois, at least early on in the game, because you can get blitzed pretty quickly by a great team. And Moorhead State and Duquesne are simply not what what Iowa State is. And I was a little worried, like, hey, is Illinois going to come out prepared? Because they're they're thinking they're coming off a cakewalk against Duquesne. And whenever they gave the first punch, I was like, okay, this is Illinois basketball. They are prepared. They aren't letting Iowa State's uh, experience in a tougher road in this NCAA tournament uh, to get in the way of playing great basketball, and that's what they did. Check it out. says, uh, we can't complain about the refs. The Illini had plenty of fouls, free throw shots uh, that they missed. Yeah, I think we got a a lot of favorable calls uh, our way in that first half, if I'm being completely honest. And then it got kind of switched and went to the other way in the second half uh, and particularly with that last foul on Shannon and you had that egregious call on Coleman Hawkins uh, when it was a clear block he he was there almost a second and a half before uh, the guy plowed through to him but you know Terrence did what he needed to do you know he got Iowa State committing fouls and we were in the bonus relatively early and that's you know that sort of I think that's probably going to be the key to the game tomorrow against UConn. And, you know, I don't know if you want to start talking about that, but UConn has some dudes on that team. They are, in my opinion, the best team in the country. Um, you know, I think they're better than Purdue is. They've just, they've got size. They've got speed. They got, they can shoot. Um, they're the number two offensive team in the country, you know, only behind us, except for they play defense pretty well too. And so, you know, whereas we are kind of more recently playing uh, a little bit better defense, but you know there's a huge gap there. And I, mean, I think I saw we opened up at as seven and a half point underdogs, but now in some books have it as high as UConn minus ten. So a lot of the money is coming on uh, the Huskies, uh, probably deserved, but I don't know. I I just got a feeling. Illinois has the length 
to disrupt a little bit of what UConn wants to do. When you have a lot of guys that are above 6'6", that's going to lead to some problems where UConn hasn't really faced a team like that. So Illinois is going to be able to switch defensively a lot um, where and UConn's just going to have to take their time and find out what matchup they would like to exploit, whether it be with Marcus Damask or if Luke Goody is in. I mean, that's going to have to be the play uh, defensively for the Illini is to just try to keep those matchups in the most favorable favorable position as possible for the longest time and then hope I, UConn just gets a bad shot at the end of the shot clock. I mean, that's going to be the key defensively. Offensively, I really feel like uh, it's going to have to be the Terrence Shannon show. If Terrence Shannon gets 28-plus points, I feel like Illinois – will at least be in the conversation. It'll be like a three to four point game maybe. And then it's just all about two possessions that might tell the story of this, of this Illini UConn game. But I don't look at this as a huge, like, Oh my God, Illinois is just going to get dominated in this elite eight game. Um, just because of how they played against the likes of Purdue. I mean, Purdue is kind of similar ish in a way with having a really tall guy down low, I know Klingon's not uh, Zach Eady level of offensive talent, even at that height. But Illinois has never been like truly embarrassed by Purdue this year, and I don't expect that to happen against UConn either. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of Terrence. I I think in order for us to win, we're going to have to play a perfect game, and that perfect game may need to be a forty burger from Terrence Shannon. Uh, he's just one of those guys where. He needs to continue being the best player on the court. Um, you know, the limelight's on him now. You know, all these publications are releasing articles, uh, kind of bringing his story to light. And so people are paying attention. Uh, you, I don't know how much you pay attention to UConn Twitter, which is a group I was just introduced to uh, as of this morning. And wow, that's a very confident bunch. Uh, I'll try to put it that way. But the trolls are going to be coming. Uh, you know. I don't doubt it that Terrence is going to be ready, but we're going to need his best game of the year to beat UConn. You know, obviously the defending national champion, like they've been here before. It's not like Iowa State, who I feel like kind of had that nerves at the beginning of the game. UConn's not going to have any nerves. UConn's done this before. They went all the way last year. They are planning on going all the way this year. So this is going to be a game where, I think we're advantageous in this in the sense that we are so difficult to game plan against the way we play offense. We are it's just so fast. We have different ways that styles that we can play. We don't run plays for our best offensive player, our leading scorer, the third leading scorer in the country. And that's something that's just really difficult to game plan against. And the fact that we're playing UConn on you know, with just one day of prep in between gives us a chance. Yeah. I mean, Hurley is an unbelievable coach. Like I have not seen a coach that has built something so effectively, so quickly like Danny Hurley has done. It's just been impressive to see, but this is kind of like the uh, Bill Belichick uh, thing where it's like, if you want Bill Belichick, you don't want him at the Super Bowl. You want him in the conference uh, championship game because that's whenever you can take advantage of the short turnaround time. And I feel like that can be the situation here. When you have an elite player that Danny Hurley just didn't have time to build a true game plan around, um, I feel like that's this is the kind of matchup that can give UConn some issues. And listen, we've only had one repeat champion since Florida. I, it's very tough for me to just be like, yeah, that, UConn's going to do it. Like when it hasn't happened at that clip, like it does in women's basketball, it's very tough for me to be like, yeah, UConn's just guaranteed to win it. So I feel like there's something that has to give with this UConn team. Maybe it is this, uh, maybe it is this Illini team to uh, knock UConn off the perch. Um, they only have three opportunities left to get knocked off the perch, but I feel like Illinois has as decent a shot as any in the country. 
Yeah, I mean, that's why ultimately I predicted Purdue to win the national championship. Uh, again, I do think UConn is the best team in the country. I think they're the most well-rounded. Uh, they've got, I think Hurley's a fantastic coach. I may not like him personally very much, but uh, you know they've done it before. They're a fantastic team. I think the best in the country. But as you said, it's just so hard to repeat in men's college basketball. And so that's why, you know, should it happen that Purdue-UConn uh, matchup, it's going to be uh, a good game. Um, Ryan chimes in. Thank you uh, for uh, watching, Ryan. Before the tournament started, I thought UConn, Purdue, and Creighton were the worst matchups for us. Teams that have an elite big who protects the rim, rebounds, and scores. Uh, yeah, I mean, UConn's a bad matchup for anyone. <laughs> well, we're not exactly unique uh, on that front. And it's it's going to be you know a really, really tough game. Check it out. It says, don't think Damask will be able to play booty ball without a pick. I think he can. I think Iowa State's defense just naturally works against booty ball, and I don't know how replicable that defense is, especially in such a short amount of time. UConn's going to play their game. Uh, they have trust in their own systems that they don't have to change anything. So I think there are going to be some booty ball opportunities for Marcus Damask, and it's not just going to be like, well, we got to throw that strategy completely out the window. I think Illinois' length will help them uh, regardless. You just got to get some offensive output from Ty Rogers. You, every All five guys have to help out with this offense. So mm-hmm. I, I really feel like uh, Ty Rogers has to at least put eight points in the hole uh, for Illinois to win this game, and that's possible. There's mm-hmm. offensive rebounds that can happen. Illinois is going to have to be ten- have the tenacity on the offensive rebounding side because watching that UConn San Diego State game, wow. The offensive rebounds that UConn were, were getting was just incredible. So if Illinois rebounds the ball well, which they have all season long, outside of a few weird bounces against Purdue and Champaign, Illinois has a shot to limit those second chance opportunities. I don't think UConn wants to see Illinois. You know, I think, uh, you know, it's, again, for all the reasons that we mentioned. Um, Obviously, they're favored, and the line is moving more and more in their favor. But I know Dan Hurley's was hoping probably that we got upset somewhere. I'm sure they would have much rather have seen Iowa State, despite Iowa State being the higher seed. Uh, I want to give attention to this uh, comment by Gary, which a lot of people have been kind of... uh, saying this uh, in the comments of the videos and reaching out to me on Twitter, um, saying the same thing. Sonny doesn't believe in the Illini. An Illini potter who said Illinois State would win. If you're going to be an Illinois podcaster, have belief in your team. Now, I feel like I've always tried to be fair in my, what I call, finalysis. Uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously, I'm an Illinois fan. But if I just blindly predict Illinois to win every single time, then what value is that providing? Uh, for me, Dang, you know, who's the negative guy on this Illinois podcast now? <laughs> I just negative. Right. right. Usually I'm the positive one, and uh, Austin is the more negative Nancy uh, of our duo. But, you know, like, and I just had a lot of respect for Iowa State, and I thought that they were a fantastic basketball team. I said the game would be close. And I just thought Iowa State would make the plays at the end, but they obviously just weren't ready for the stage, and the Illini were. And trust me, I'm happy. I'm super excited. You know, I talked about, I think in our preview show, I said our ceiling was Elite Eight, and that's where we're at now. Uh, Now, granted, had I known how the season would play out, I would change my answer to national champion, because I do think right now on our best day, we can beat anybody in the country. But, um, yeah, it's not that I'm being negative, uh, you know, and I really enjoy doing what I'm doing with this Illini cast show. But, you know, I'm just trying to give you my honest opinion. That's all. It's uh, it's not that I don't believe in the Illini uh, by any stretch. It's I, I really do. I, I'm a big Brad guy. I'm hyping him up on, you know, anytime I get a chance on the show, whether Twitter, whatever it is, it's uh yeah, but again, I just wanted to address that because a lot of you have mentioned that. Simeon, I know, uh, I don't know if you're watching live, but you're going to be watching at some point. You're going to kind of say the same thing to keep the faith. The faith is there. I promise, guys. I, the faith is there. These are just my 
honest, genuine opinions, but understand that behind that, I'm still rooting like hell for the Atlanta to win. I really feel like this should have been a Final Four matchup or a national championship matchup. You look at who's left in the region with Alabama and Clemson. One of those teams is going to the Final Four. No, I mean, both UConn and Illinois should be in the Final Four. Like, that's that's the frustrating part of this NCAA tournament is that you see a region like that, and then you see Iowa State, Illinois, and UConn battling out just to get to Arizona. I mean, that's just the wild part of this tournament. It should be Illinois, Purdue, and UConn, as of what I've seen so far in this tournament. Those three should be in the final four, um, but one of those teams can't because of the way the bracket was set up. So the path that UConn has had to have is kind of incredible. They've had three final four teams from the last final four in that in this region. Illinois, the Big Ten champion, and then Iowa State, uh, the number two seed. And this this region, whoever gets out of it, Illinois or UConn, um, they've, they've had to avoid some landmines in there and uh they've had some tough competition but man this game i i just can't i can't believe it's here and uh, check it out seven is right all the pressures on uconn to win if uconn falls behind they may collapse under the weight of their expectations i mean this is a confident group in uconn but wow if they do fall behind that, that'll be a first in a very 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 long time and I agree with this comment by Bootzilla as well. I feel like in some ways this is the national championship because I feel like the winner is going to win the title. A lot of people have been saying that, and I, I'm not disagreeing with you. You have uh, a Goliath, though, on the opposite side of the bracket that might have something to say about that in uh-huh. Zach Eady and Purdue. Illinois is 0-2 against Purdue. Will that happen a third time? I don't know if this matchup happens again, um, but that's a tough task for whatever team – comes out of this side of the bracket all right so austin to wrap it up i I saw this fantastic question on twitter and i wanted to bring it on the show and i'm going to do a poll uh once we're done and uh for those of you watching i want your answer in the comments too because i'm very curious on what you think one what your answer is okay so the question is would you trade going 0 and 12 next college football season for a national title for the basketball team this year i've seen it it was like oh for 12 the next decade oh was it the next decade okay yeah maybe oh, let's do like the next two years we win three games let's, let's change around yes a little bit. because i would say yes for the next two years because as a football program you can build up from the next two years um i i would do the next decade because i feel like then illinois would get relegated from the big 10 in this weird world of college realignment. Um, But the next two years, hell yes. Hell yes. I would Uh, verbatim. Check it out. uh, Agrees with you. Hell yes. Is his answer. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I'm a big football guy. I know a lot of uh, Illini fans aren't. And I think if uh, we pulled a lot of Illini nation, we'd be getting a lot of hell yeses uh, just because the uh, football interest is not nearly there. Uh, like basketball is, but I think I would too. You know, again, as much as, you know, I'm a season ticket holder, I have been for years, but seeing us hoist a trophy, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to see that in my lifetime as an Illinois fan. Um, You know, I'd like to think with basketball that, you know, with the way things are going and with the way Brad has built this program that we're going to have opportunities to, in the next few years, at least during his run, but I'm not guaranteed that. And so I think, you know, to be able to confirm and be sure that, you know, I get to see it once in my life. Sorry, Brett. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, uh, football coaching staff. I think I would take it. I mean, any playoff appearance is not guaranteed to result in success. I mean, you look at the heroics that happened for the 2016 Cubs to win that World Series. I mean, being down three to one, um, you could get into a situation like Arizona that they're in. Tommy Lloyd has lost three straight Sweet 16s to lower seeds, and Arizona fans are so perplexed about this. They know he's a great coach, but 
he just can't get it done in the postseason. And it's a little bit of a weirder situation than Brad because he's got out of the first weekend. But that Sweet 16 is just a brick wall that Tommy Lloyd can't uh, burst through. Um, and I feel like if I had one guarantee of a national title, I could watch uh, the rafter, uh, watch the banner go up in the rafters and know that I was alive when it happened. It's just incredible. Uh, I, I would absolutely uh, trade that. All right. So I guess uh, as we're closing up shop, um, final predictions. I have the I, I've not been a total fanboy at all during this podcast. Like I will say that. Um I firmly believe that Illinois will win by three points against UConn. Because I feel like Terrence Shannon will be able to carry them to a victory. We've seen in the NBA a great team versus a great player. And sometimes that great player just wins. And especially in one game where it's not seven, I feel like that can be the case here in this NCAA tournament. Um, LeBron James with the Cavs did it against the Boston Celtics. He did it against the Orlando Magic. The Orlando Magic were an unbelievable team that year. And LeBron James beat them. So I firmly believe that Terrence Shannon's on a Kemba Walker-like run. Again, a UConn reference. And I don't know if there's a team that can stop him, maybe outside of West Lafayette. Yeah, uh, I'm going to do it again, and I apologize, but I'm going to say I'm just a little worried. You know, Damask playing 40 minutes, we're going to ask him to do it again against elite level uh, competition. I'm going to say UConn kind of gets away uh, from us at the end of the game. It's going to be a 91-77. I got something in my eye. Uh, loss for the Illini. Um, I may or may not be predicting that score on purpose or sides on purpose. I'll let you guys kind of judge um, what's going on. Jeffrey uh, chimes in. Illini alum from Central Illinois here in L.A. County. Thanks for watching, Jeffrey. Thank you for watching in Los Angeles. That's amazing. <sighs> The Illini cast reach to California. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's amazing. I love it. Uh, hopefully, we'll be reaching uh, a lot of people in Phoenix uh, next weekend with a victory against UConn. We'll, we'll take a look. Jeffrey says he's subbed too. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. If you guys don't mind, share this with your friends. Again, you know we're uh, we're a smaller podcast. Our, our goal is to hit that one thousand mark. A uh, thousand is amazing for um, us. Uh, YouTube wise, uh, we just show up in the algorithm more and other Illini fans are going to be able to see it. Um, I will say tonight, I plan on coming on jumping on YouTube, it's not going to be an official show. Uh, it's just going to kind of be let's I'm trying to enjoy the moment right now. I don't know how many more times we can make the Elite Eight. I kind of want to savor it kind of have fun with it. So I'm going to be jumping on. I've already reached out to a couple different guests. Um, if you want to come on, you want to talk ball with me, let me know. I might just leave a link in the discussion. You know, it might be, uh, it might be a 20 minute show. It might go for two hours. It might go for three hours. Whatever. It's just we we can talk about whatever you guys want. You know, whether it's the season, uh, if you want to talk baseball started, uh, whatever it might be. Um, uh, I think I set it up for nine o'clock tonight. So. Be on the lookout. Again, subscribe if you haven't subscribed before. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, you know, if you missed the first part of the conversation, uh, you know, we're under a new umbrella now. So we're really appreciative of Armchair Illini and that umbrella that we're going to be in. And uh, Austin and I, we do plan on contributing on the writing uh, aspect too. And uh, Austin, any final thoughts? Uh, go Illini. Again, Elite Eights don't come often in this program. And Hopefully this is the start of a elite eight run um, that we can just be like, Oh yeah. I remember a couple of years ago when we were like, we, we don't make elite eights and it's just become the norm for Illinois basketball under Brad Underwood. But uh, yeah, I cannot believe that this happened. I feel like the energy of Illini nation is at its peak. Um, I was at my, I was at a, a career fair in St. Joe Ogden high school. And this is a quick story. And 
I was at the Monocles Pizza after I got done presenting, and the amount of Illini shirts in that high school and at that Monocles brought me back to my own childhood, where in central Illinois, guys were wearing D Brown jerseys uh, and were wearing Illini stuff all the time. And we lost that generation of kids in the John Gross and late Bruce Weber era. I think it's back. I saw kids wearing Terrence Shannon Jr. stuff, Io DeSumo stuff, Kofi Coburn stuff. And I'm like, this is how universities grow, not only in the athletics program, but for enrollment purposes um, of getting those Central Illinois kids just invigorated to be like, I want good grades to go to the Illini um, and be in the Orange Crush. And I feel like that generation of kids is back and it's great to see. It brings almost a tear to my eye um seeing it and so i just thought it was a lot like my childhood uh seeing those central illinois kids uh in f- investing in this program and um just uh, having that energy i was watching the game with a buddy with blair who's been on the show um in his basement in decatur and uh the vibes were immaculate in that basement and um celebrating jumping around with the fellas it was great uh just an unbelievable vibe last night if i was facetiming with family i mean it was a very much reminiscent of the 2016 cubs world series twin where people's phones were just buzzing uh wanting to call each other and and share the good news yeah I, my son is three and he knows like anytime there's a game coming on he and i've got my Illini gear on he knows to just he by himself he'll go upstairs into the closet and grab his blue and orange shirt like he knows he doesn't understand what's going on uh, he knows you're supposed to put the ball in the hoop. And, you know, I have his own little hoop that he plays uh, on um, while I'm watching the game, kind of. But it's the same thing. You know, if I can kind of transfer my love and passion for the Illini over to him, um, the Illini can make it a lot easier for me if they're good at basketball. <laughs> and right now, yeah. Brad Underwood and company, they're really good at basketball. And so, you know, I completely agree with you. You know, I'm really excited. I'm hoping the run is not over tomorrow. And again, I just want to make it clear that despite me picking UConn to win does not mean I don't think Illinois can win. I genuinely think um, there's not a team in the country on any given night that this Illinois team cannot defeat. And so if we're able to play our A-plus game, if Terrence continues being the monster that he can, you know, who knows? I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really glad it's a five o'clock game tomorrow and not a 9.30 p.m. game. Uh, you know, I'll be able to just kind of enjoy. We'll, possibly we'll do a post game. Uh, Austin and I will kind of check in with each other uh, and see how that goes. But let's all enjoy the ride, guys. It's, uh, you know, as you said, you know, back in the early 2000s, we thought we'd be doing this constantly. Um, life has shown that that's not always going to be the case. You just never know what's going to happen the following year. And especially the way the college athletics landscape seems to just to be changing drastically, like by the month. Uh, I have no idea what college athletics is going to look like next month, uh, not to mention, you know, a year or two or three from now. So let's just bask, let's just enjoy at this point, it's house money for me. I'm not going to be upset if we lose to uh, UConn. I'm not going to be happy, but uh, the, the season itself has been a successful one. Uh, this is one of the most enjoyable, if not the most enjoyable, Illini team I've ever had the pleasure of watching. And now, um, you know, thanks to Austin uh, covering. And uh, let's just uh, enjoy. ILL, INI, and this has been an episode of the Illini cast part of the Armchair Illini Network. Thank you, guys.